In today's world, people feel lost in a sea of ideas. Which ones should we accept? Stay tuned because you're listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. Here is your host, Kurt Jarris. This morning, here at Christ Church of Oakbrook at Love God with Your Mind, the Defenders Conference. And if you are uh, listening to us live on the internet, uh, we've had a few uh, technical difficulties, but hopefully everything's working at least on your end. And uh, it's so glad to be with you here this morning. Uh, we've got a stripped down studio here at uh, Christ Church. We've got my laptop and our, our Blue Yeti Pro microphone, and we've got a crowd of a few people, right? Yeah. All right, well, thanks. Thanks for joining me. So this morning we're going to be talking about Christian orthodoxy and, um, and, and what exactly that is. And uh, there was a famous fellow named Vincent of Lorenz who gave us a, a formula um, for recognizing the standard or the rule of faith that we'll be talking about as well. If you do have questions throughout uh, the time here, um, actually what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to go turn on this uh, microphone here and so then you can just come up at any time. Come up at any time and we'll, we'll have a nice little conversation. So that should be good to go. Okay. So, um, usually with Veracity Hill, we take live callers. Um, today, however, given that we've got a more stripped-down studio, we're not going to be doing that. But in case you do want to call in, uh, if, if you're here in the audience or listening now, the number is 5052 and then strive, because here at Veracity Hill we are striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. So that number again is 5052 strive, and the numerical version is 505 278 7483. And you don't have to call even when we're live, you can leave us a message, and we'll we'll take the call in the in the next episode or review any comments that you may have, and ha- happy to do that. Okay, so Christian Orthodoxy. What is that about? Well, um, orthodoxy uh, deals with um, a right thinking, right beliefs, proper beliefs. And what is it that the church has believed? And, and how is it that we come to these beliefs about what the Bible teaches? Well, um, I'm a Protestant, and so in Protestantism there's a large emphasis on sola scriptura. That is, scripture alone as the authority on doctrinal matters. But what should be uh, nuanced is this isn't solo scriptura. So scripture is not the only source. Is the, it's not the only authority. Uh, so there are other authorities of knowledge. For example, reason or tradition or experience. This is how you can know some things. So we really need to be careful when we say Scripture is the ultimate authority, that's not saying it's the only authority. And here's why. Well, the Bible doesn't say that I, Kurt Jarrus, exist. Therefore, we can't know if I exist. Well, that's silly, right? We know that I exist. We know that, you know, Abraham Lincoln was the President of the United States, even though the Bible doesn't talk about it. This is really important because a very core doctrinal belief of Christianity, the term Trinity or Latin, Trinitas, is not in the Bible. The word is not there, but the concept is there. And so it took uh, a few decades, a couple centuries, for the Christian church to to, uh, formulize what the Bible was talking about, the concepts therein. And so then we came up with a word uh, that, that signified, represented those concepts. Okay, so... Uh, Also, let me say that with Scripture, the early church didn't have all of the New Testament written. So, imagine you are a Christian living, say, in the second century. What is your sola scriptura? What is your scripture? Well, it's certainly not all of the documents. Perhaps you didn't have some of the documents of the the New Testament because it it hadn't been copied into your area yet. You know, the church hadn't made enough copies. So maybe you didn't know about, you know, say, 1st, 2nd, or 3rd John, or Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Um, and, then, and then, of course, there's a whole other discussion that we perhaps won't get into today about the canonization of the New Testament itself. Why should some letters and some books be in the New Testament and others not? 
So that's a, that's a whole other topic. Okay, so, but Christian Orthodoxy, I'm just, this is the tip of the tip of the iceberg, what we're going to talk about today. I'll bring up a few heresies and whatnot, but really just want to lay the groundwork as best I can for helping you understand how and why these, these views came into being. So, Vincent of Lorenz, and he's one of the fellows that I'm studying about in my doctrinal work, he wrote a, a work called A Colonatorium, and uh, the purpose for his work was to, to help his weak memory. So he wrote these things so he could remember them. Uh, but interestingly enough, he wrote a first edition that was stolen. And so he had to make a new second copy. And, and we, we believe it's stolen because the first historian that talks about it, uh, it happened a few, uh, a few centuries later. So it's sort of just through oral tradition. Maybe his memory was so bad, maybe he just lost it. <laughs> but tradition holds that it was a stolen document, and so he had to rewrite it. And so the belief that uh, historical theologians have is that this is actually just the second half of that original work. And this is a big work as well. So uh, I'm going to read some excerpts from the Colonatorium so you can get a feel for how fervent he is for upholding um, Orthodox belief. So here he writes that uh, within the Catholic Church itself, all possible care must be taken that we hold that faith which has been believed everywhere, always, and by all. So there's the standard, those three rules. Everywhere, always, and by all. He continues, For that is truly and in the strictest sense Catholic, which, as the name itself and the reason of the thing declare, comprehends all universality. This rule we shall observe if we follow universality, antiquity, and consent. We shall follow universality if we confess that one faith to be true, which the whole church throughout the world confesses. Antiquity, if we in no wise depart from those interpretations, which it is manifest were no notoriously held by our holy ancestors and fathers, consent in the like manner, if in antiquity itself we adhere to the consent consentient definitions and determinations of all, or at the least of almost all priests and doctors. Boy, people had a way with words back in the day, huh? Um... So there he gives the description of what he means, right? Universality, antiquity, and consent, or, in more common language we use today, everywhere, always, and by all. So the rule of faith here, what was to be Orthodox Christian belief, or this is what the Church believes, has been believed, and we would say generally, generally, not necessarily universally. And that's a careful nuance, because sometimes bishops rose up with their beliefs, and so, and it wasn't just one person. Sometimes they had whole groups of people that agreed with, agreed with them. Uh, so Athanasius was a church father who, um, who actually had the entire church roughly against his view for a long time. And he was excommunicated, he was exiled. But lo and behold, he proved through his robust defenses, no, this is what the church has held. And eventually his view became the dominantly accepted position. So even still, a majority may not be um, ultimately, it may for, for a period, but when you look at the broad history, what's been believed everywhere, that, that's the rule of thumb there. Um, always, there you get the time, and by all, all people. And again, that's a general all. Um, okay, so, there's, um, I want to read a couple passages here from his commandatorium about, um, about those rabid dogs, Nestorius, Apollinarius, and Photinus who bark against the Catholic faith. Photinus, by denying the Trinity. Apollinaris, by teaching that the nature of the word is mutable. It changes, right? Uh, and refusing to acknowledge that there are two substances in Christ. Dying, uh, denying, moreover, either that Christ had a soul at all, or at all events, that he had a rational soul. Asserting that the word of God supplied the place of the rational soul. Nestorius, by affirming that there were always, or at any rate, that once there were two Christs. But the Catholic Church, holding the right faith, both concerning God and concerning our Savior, is guilty of blasphemy, neither in the mystery of the Trinity, nor in that of the incarnation of Christ. So essentially this whole work is to a robust defense of Christian orthodoxy. But I've already said a few terms that some of you are like, huh? So, let's take a step back. There are two branches of core Christian beliefs. Uh, the Trinity and the two natures of Christ, okay? 
And, um, and interestingly enough, so usually there, when I've um, been to apologetics conferences, there aren't usually breakouts on this. It's more theology proper than apologetics proper. But certainly if we are to defend our faith, we have to defend our core beliefs. And if we don't know what those beliefs are, or we don't know how to articulate them all that well, or communicate those idea to, ideas to people, well then we may not be able to defend the faith all that well. So hopefully what we'll, we'll speak on uh, and, and discuss a little bit this morning here is just going to give you a little bit that you can go off of and, and you can go home and perhaps look up more and research more. You're like, oh, what was Nestorianism again? Well, we're going to go over a few of those terms. So there are two rules. So there are two branches, and I say that there's two rules. So one rule here, one rule here, that will really just help you get the basics down. Rule number one for the Trinity there is one essence, one essence of God, one divine essence, sometimes it's called a substance, one divine essence, but there are three persons, three persons, one essence, three persons. Let me put it more simply, and this will help you in the future to remember this. There is one what, but three who's. Okay? One what but three who's. Now, to our minds, that might be difficult to grasp. And some of the church fathers are not afraid to shy away from simply calling it a mystery. How there is one what, but three who's. Those three who's being the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. However mysterious it may be, it is not, properly speaking, a contradiction. It's not a logical contradiction. A logical contradiction is A or not A. Right? So it's, I am standing here or sitting here right now at this very moment, or I'm not here right now at this very moment. Right? Th that's a contradiction. I mean, it's one or the other. So, one what, three who's is not a contradiction. Even though it may be very difficult to grasp and a divine mystery. All right. So that's the rule. Again, very simply, one what, three who's. Or to use the more uh, theological language, one essence, three persons. The rule about Christology, the study of Christ, Christology. That Jesus is one person with two natures. A full human nature and a full divine nature. Okay? Again, Jesus is one person with two natures. A fully human nature and a fully divine nature. And so we're going to get a little bit into the, the heresies on both of these sides. So I'll mention a few of these terms and I'll talk about how they have strayed away from these definitions here that the church has agreed upon. And usually what has happened is the church develops um, the doctrine through controversy. Through controversy. Um, when... It realized, oh, people are speaking, they are presenting and preaching on different doctrines on, say, Christology. So some people would say, oh, well, Jesus is one person. And you'd have other people saying, oh, no, Jesus is two persons, right? There's one person for each of the natures. There's one who for e each of the one what's. So for the fully human nature, there is a human person. And for the fully divine nature, there's a divine person. So there would be these doctrinal rifts in the church. And it was only through these massive councils. First it would start locally. You'd have local councils, regional councils. But then you would have scenarios where the whole church would come together at what's called the ecumenical councils. And so that's where we get our core Christian beliefs at those ecumenical councils, right? Because it's everyone. It's representative of the whole church. Now that reminds me. So here when I've read Vincent, he, he's used the term Catholic. I don't want you to be confused here. He does not mean here Roman Catholic in the sense that we understand it today. He, he lived back in the, um, the 400s. And so this was before uh, the Great Schism, which separated the East from the West. Or for you, let's see, the East from the West, if you're looking that way. Um, and so when he is using this term Catholic here, he just means the universal church. Because there wasn't a split yet. So whereas we use the term Catholic as a shorthand for Roman Catholic, uh, for the Roman Catholic Church and their proper and, and their beliefs and whatnot. Um, so that's all he means there, so I don't want you to be confused on that. Okay, 
So why don't we go through a few heresies together? Yay! <laughs> and so we can learn some labels here, and you can learn to identify. You'll see here that there's nothing new under the sun. Okay? So we're going to talk about uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, and you will see... Oh, wait, that's this view, or that's that view, right? So you can see the church has already dealt with these beliefs. So if you want to learn how to, um, how to engage in, with or against cults today, right? Just study church history. Study those beliefs, because you'll see, oh, well, this is this. The church has already dealt with that. And here's, here are the arguments for that. So, and they, they apply just the same. Okay, what do you want to start with first? Trinitarian or Christological heresies? Christological. Christological, good. I've, I've studied Christological heresies a bit more, so I'm glad you decided that. So we'll spend maybe a little bit less time on the Trinitarian ones. <laughs> okay, so we heard uh, this term, uh, or, or this fellow, Nestorius, right? Okay, so Nestorius believed that the divine person, the Logos, the Word, right? When the Word was incarnated in the flesh, that it was, here you go, God in a bod. All right? Nestorianism is God in a bod. It's God, the divine nature, in a human flesh. So, the divine um, soul and the divine mind were the the main forces here. Oh, sorry, did I say Nestorian or Apollinarius? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm already s skipping up or screwing up here. So, sorry. Nestor Nestorianism is two persons. So, uh, so the one I just described, God and Abad, that's uh, Apollinarianism. I'm sorry. So let's start with Nestorianism. Uh, and that's two persons. So you've got the fully human nature, right, and the fully divine nature, and then there's one person for each nature. So Nestorian, Nestorian posited that there are Two people in Jesus. Okay, but when we read the New Testament, uh, the God, when you read the Gospel accounts, when you read the view of the, the early church, the apostles, what they believed, they, they only worship one person. It is God Himself, God in the flesh. It's not. Oh, you're just wor worshiping the divine person. And you're not worshiping the, the human person. There's only one person there. Um, and I'd be happy to get into biblical passages that, the support, that support this as well. But remember, I'm just trying to do the tip of the iceberg today. So if, if you want these, this information, I'd be happy to send you some, some resources or ways. So just go ahead and uh, shoot me a message or uh, give me a call at 5052 Strive. That's Rusty Hill's number there. Um, or you can leave a, a comment at our website as well. Um, okay, so that's essentially Nestorianism. Apollinarianism, God in the body. Sorry. So here you have that, that Jesus was, um, that God just took upon human flesh. Okay? But not a human mind and not a human soul. Okay? So in, in essence, Christ is not fully man. Jesus is not fully man. And one of the concerns that the early church had here was that, well, if Jesus was not fully man, how could he full, how could he heal and save us? Because what has not been assumed cannot be healed. Right? That's a, uh, what a famous church father wrote. Um, so Jesus needs to be fully man in order for atonement to be successful. And since we think that atonement is fully successful... Well, he must be fully man. And, of course, the scripture attests to this, right? That Jesus is like us in every way except without sin, right? That comes from Hebrews. Um, and uh, in terms of his full uh, deity, Paul writes that the fullness of deity dwells in him. Right? The scripture is quite clear on these matters. On, on the fullness of his humanity and the fullness of his divinity. Now, of course, maybe some people thought, well, we've got to nuance this in some ways. And remember now, while we may, in retrospect, call these individuals heretics, right? They were church leaders, and they were trying to think through these things. And so sometimes, these leaders would posit they would have their ideas, 
Um, and they might be rebuked, they might be corrected, and sometimes this happens, they would just they would change their mind and realize the error of their ways. And oftentimes they would write to each other, um, they communicate with one another through letters, uh, because sometimes they didn't always have these letters uh, or books that the early church had that the other church fathers wrote. Um, so I mean, just imagine the world that they lived in, right? It was much different than our own, right? Today we just send emails. Today they had to go months or years, um, you know, before they discovered or um, heard about some document that explains a certain doctrine, like Athanasius is on the Incarnation. Um, okay, so Nestorianism, Apollinarianism. Okay, how about Eutychianism? Or this is told by Eudix, was his name. He believed that the human nature of Jesus was absorbed by the Logos. Absorbed. So it went into. Okay? And so the concern here that the church had was that the, the different natures were no longer becoming distinct. Okay? And so we believe that there's a union of the two natures. Not that it was absorbed into it, if that makes sense. So the human nature is not lost because it's absorbed. It's still distinct. Um, all right. Monophysitism. Um, there are a couple people, and there are some people still today that went to monophysitism, actually. And interestingly enough, a number of Protestants, a number of uh, their... Their theological views, perhaps they haven't studied enough on church history, so they fall into this. This is the idea that um, Christ only has um, one nature. One nature. Now, so they might not be aware that their view, um, it essentially it lapses into it. So they're not aware of the logical consequence of what happens. And then what is more popular is that Christ only had one will. That's called monothelitism. So that there's only one will. Actually, the orthodox position is that Jesus had two wills, a divine will and a human will. That's the orthodox view. But you usually think, well, one person, a person only has a will. Well, perhaps the nature has the will, right? A will associated with the natures. How are we doing on time here? Okay, we're doing all right. Um, I wanted to look up something, interestingly enough, before we get to the, the Trinitarian heresies. Let me see if I can find... There was a study done... Um, a couple of years ago, um, surveying evangelicals and their knowledge of Christian orthodoxy. And the uh, results were quite surprising. Let's see if I can... Yes, here we go. So in Christianity Today, 2014, a couple of years ago, new poll finds evangelicals' favorite heresies. The survey finds many American evangelicals hold unorthodox views on the Trinity, salvation, and other doctrines. Okay. A quarter of evangelicals that were polled said that God the Father is more divine than Jesus. More divine. More divine. And 9% weren't sure. 16% say that Jesus was the first creature created by God, while 11% were unsure. So how do we make sense of certain phrases that, um, that Christ is the only begotten, right, uh, son, or the firstborn of all creation? Right, firstborn, oh, that must mean, must mean creation, right? Well, not necessarily when you understand what the firstborn is about, when you understand the Old Testament, what the firstborn was, the best of the best. Um, okay, so let's move over a little bit into Trinitarian heresies. Okay, here we have dynamic monarchianism. All right, so Theodotus, a learned leather merchant from Byzantium, brought to Rome the teaching that Jesus was a mere man who was endowed with the Spirit at his baptism. This is very similar to the concept of adoptionism. That Christ is just a man that was adopted as deity, but was not eternally divine. 
have many of you have heard the term Arianism. This is one of the most famous heresies. Raise your hand if you've heard that term Arianism before. Okay. Yeah, so here we get uh, the views that seeking to defend the uniqueness of the one indivisible and eternal God, Arius, denied that the Son is co-eternal divine person. Is co-eternal, so he denied that, insisting that uh, Christ was a created being. That's not necessarily to mean that he was adopted so it doesn't say that he was a human and then became divine. It's to say that he's a divine creation. right? So he still lived before the creation of the world, but he was created. He is not um, eternally generated by the Father. So that's Arianism. So, um, of today's cults that you might think of, might you know which one is holds to Arianism? You might be able to actually, so you could certainly couple it with Jehovah's Witnesses, who uh, um, think that Jesus, well actually their, their view might fit closer to adoptionism. Um, but you uh, you could certainly think of Mormonism as well, right? So in, in Mormonism, God, uh, the Father, there's a spirit, uh, spirit divine being, a spirit father, who has spirit babies. And they are the gods of the planet. So Jesus is an exalted man. Uh, he's a creation, right? He hasn't existed for all eternity. And so he, he rules our planet. So, um, But interestingly enough, you'll get, you will have Mormons tell you certain different things because sometimes Mormons don't know exactly what they believe either. Uh, in the same way that Christians may say things and they may not know what the orthodoxy is. Um, so you might not know exactly what you'll get. Uh, from an understanding of Mormons. So, for example, Mormons will say, oh, well, I just, I agree, agree with what you believe. There's one God. Well, no, they don't actually think that. They think there are an infinite number of gods. They're polytheists. Even though they may not know it. I mean, if you go read their, their doctrinal beliefs. So, quite, quite eye-opening, yeah. Okay, let's go through a couple others here. Modalism, this is a good one. Um, so, Noetus of uh, Smyrna was condemned by his elder for vigorously maintaining the view that it was one God, the Father, who had suffered and sustained all of Christ's human experiences, giving this heresy the alternative name of patri Passionism. I'm not pronouncing that in the Latin very well, but um, essentially it's that the Father suffered on the cross. And that is radical. Um, you can say God suffered on the cross. Now that's something some Protestants don't like to hear. You can't say God suffered on the cross. But you would say um, that it was Jesus specifically. So you wouldn't say the Father, it was Jesus. And he suffered with respect to human na his human nature. So you just got to be careful with those nuances. What, what you are attributing to, to which nature. Okay, so um, Sibelius refined his view in the 3rd century... And so now it's also called Sabellianism. So there are, there are sub-heresies of broader heresies, if that makes sense, subcategories. So Sibelius believed that um, the Godhead operates in three modes. So the Father is God, kind of, right? But then he just appears as Jesus. So he's not really, there aren't two or three persons. It's one person that just operates in different modes. So some people um, will say, well, they put on different hats, right? You've got your dad hat, you've got your work hat, you've got your hobbies hat that you wear. That's modalism, right? That's not actually the Christian view. Right? Um, and we try to come up with analogies to understand the Trinity. Have you heard of like water appears as, right, a liquid, a solid, and a gas, right? Or the egg, right? You've got the shell, the white, the, the yolk, right? Some of these are simply put heretical <laughs> when, you, when you push them, of course, to their logical points. Oftentimes when we're teaching little kids these, using these analogies, we're not uh, purposefully trying to teach them heresies. We're just trying to get them to, to realize that, well, these things don't contradict, right? So that's why I think it might just be easier to teach them, oh, it's one what but three who's. One what, three who's. Oh, that's hard to understand, Mom and Dad. Yes, yes it is. And that's okay. But it's not a contradiction. Right? 
Well, I'm happy to take any questions from the audience, um, at, again, at any time. I will try my best. Again, we could get into the Bible passages and the way these guys understood those, if you'd like. I'm just trying to give you the tip of the iceberg here, though. Um, you know, because I don't want to go super over your heads for some of you that maybe have never heard these terms. So it looks like we are going to have a question from the audience. Very nice. Mr. Carr, yes, how are you doing today? Yes, sir, blessed to be here. The uh, most, say, three, four, or five familiar uh, modalists use it today, 21st century. What would those be, please? Three, four, five modalist views. Oh, wow, that's an interesting question. Uh, hmm. Let's see here. Well, I, I may have to ask you if you've got something in mind. Three, four, five. So, uh, in terms of the cults, Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses, they wouldn't say that those are modes. Um, yeah, that's a very good question. I might be stumped on that one, actually. Modalism doesn't tend to be as popular, at least I think, as other Trinitarian heresies today. Um, but certainly modalism does appear in our the analogies that we have. But yeah, go ahead, feel, feel free to elaborate. Um on maybe what you might have in mind. Sure, let me split the question in two. Uh, is it not so that the uh, Eastern Orthodox Church is substantially uh, modalist? And the second part is uh, we had had, you know, uh, home Bible studies, uh, three persons who had been uh, faithful uh, weekly participants this in English and Greek, and after two or three years, they left because he said, you still think that there is one God in three persons. Uh, hmm. So this is perhaps uh, more widespread than I didn't quite realize. Okay. Uh, that's interesting um, because in, in my study of Eastern Orthodoxy, I haven't come across that all that much. Um, in fact, some of the um, some of the ways I've learned best about Christian Orthodoxy is by studying the Greek Church Fathers. Um, so maybe it could be that. Now, let me say that there are other branches of Eastern Christianity that aren't part of the Orthodox Church. So there are, uh, say, the Ethiopian uh, Church or um, the Armenian Church. Um, and so there are other smaller churches that do hold heretical views. So um, I think let's um, let me just double check here. I want to make sure I'm being accurate. Um, for the Ethiopian Church, yeah. The, so they, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church supports the teachings of. Um, Yeah, so they're monophysites, yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah, so other members, so uh, Coptic Church, Armenian, Syrian, and Indian churches affirm uh, monophysitism, right, and uh, monophysitism. So that's the heresies that they would hold to. That's that's Christology, though. Um, yeah, so, but, so that is interesting that maybe the people you've encountered have had perhaps misunderstandings themselves. Um, because in what I have read from the Eastern Orthodox, they, they hold a very robust sense of one essence but three persons. Now, I should say, there are divisions between the East and West on the relations between the persons. Okay? So, in, in the East, you do get a more uh, hierarchical relational structure. In the West, you have more of an equal relational structure. So there might be a large emphasis on the Father in the East and then the Son, and then the Holy Spirit. Whereas in the West it might be more triangular circular, if that makes sense, in terms of their relations. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I, I couldn't answer the question all that well, but yeah, modalism you don't tend to find all that much. Um, because I would say that, well the two most popular uh, cults, uh, Christian cults, right, are Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses, and they wouldn't you could find multiple heresies in their doctrines, but uh, there wouldn't be modalism. Yeah. Oh, yeah, question. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, in your studies of the Christological and Trinitarian heresies um, that have developed, 
do you see any common themes as to why these develop or um, why do you think people develop these um, unorthodox views and why do they stick? Do you have any on that? Yeah, good, yeah. So it's not like these fellows had evil intentions, right? They weren't, they weren't trying to come into the church and to corrupt it. I would say many of them had good intentions. But sometimes good intentions isn't good enough, right? You have to have good results, right? If I wanted, if, if a plane were crashing because the pilots had both had a heart attack or something, oh, well, I want to save the plane, but you don't want me flying that plane, right? Because I have no idea how to fly the plane. So good intentions, they might be good, but you want good results. And so sometimes you wouldn't see the good results with these fellows. And often they were church, regional church leaders, bishops. Um, and so the, they would just have these, they would have disagreements. And then ultimately they had to call councils together to figure it out. And we kind of do this a little bit today, even we Protestants. We try to bring church leaders together to come on to a statement of faith. Um, the Manhattan Declaration strikes me as a contemporary example of Christian leaders coming together to talk about, you know, a, a lot of views on faith and society, the views that Christians should have. Um, so, so that's what happened. Often they came together and they they sparted out, if you will, sparred or fought intellectually. They discussed. Um, they surveyed the the scriptures. They surveyed the church teaching, right? Because if you consider Vincent's rule or canon, you will what is orthodox is what has been believed for everywhere, uh, always, and by everyone. And so, um, you follow, you try to get back to see, oh, well, what did the church believe? What did the church believe? And even Protestants today try to do this, right? We still uphold tradition, even if we don't talk about it as much, as having as much authority as scripture. Right? But we want to, part of the Reformation, was to go back. It was a rebirth, to go back to the scriptures. Let's start over, in essence. Um, so there is that attempt there. And then even today, um, the study of the church fathers is growing within um, Protestantism. I myself am part of that, since I'm just interested in learning more about the church fathers. Because, yeah, you want to see, oh, well, which church fathers did agree with Doctrine. So we have we've got church fathers, and then we even have a, a crazy uncle. We've got a church crazy uncle. So that he, that's origin, the church father origin. He helped us some good views, and he helped the church out on some good doctrinal matters. But he also helped us some unorthodox views um, on philosophy. And, um, one interesting concept that we don't believe today that a couple church fathers did because of their Platonic inf uh, uh, influences was the preexistence of the soul. Even Augustine believed that too, at least in his confessions, that souls pre exist. Right? It's a very platonic idea. Um, Origen, I believe, also held to universalism, uh, which is not the uh, not a universally accepted position. It's not orthodox. Let me also say a word about um, non essential doctrine, since I think we're uh, getting short on our time here. Um, We've got our core branches, Trinitarianism, right, and Christology. There are some doctrinal beliefs that are non-essential to the Christian, to the core Christian beliefs, the core Christian faith, okay? So I have in here, my, uh, you know, I'm interested in the Calvinism, Arminianism debate, right? I like talking about that. Um, there are some theologians, however, that go too far, I think, and say, oh, well, Arminianism is heresy. Or Calvinism is heresy. Well, it's not heresy, properly speaking, because there haven't been an ecumenical council that has surveyed the whole history of church tradition and said, oh, this is just what we've always believed. Right? Um, so there are non-essential doctrines, say, um, different views on the doctrine of hell. So uh, whether there is eternal, um, eternal conscious torment or judgment versus annihilationism, that God destroys the souls of non-believers, right? So that's an interesting topic in uh, the doctrine of hell. Um, and so there's debate on that. And you can't say one way or the other that a view is heresy. Um, what you should try and argue, I think, instead of using the word heresy, is 
heterodox. Heterodox is just untraditional. That's a bit more polite way, perhaps, of saying that you don't think this is what the early church believed. You don't think this is what Christians have believed. It doesn't fit with Vincent's rule, the canon. Um, and interestingly enough, on Vincent, let me say, so Augustine is one of the most famous church fathers. Famous church fathers in, um, in all of Christianity. And Vincent's commonatorium, the traditional view and interpretation of Vincent's commonatorium, is that he wrote it as a response against Augustine's view on predestination and the grace of God. So that's quite interesting that you have a response because they were essentially contemporary. So the commentary was written about 433 AD. Um, we know this because he says that uh, the Council of Ephesus occurred three years ago, so that's how we can date the, the document. And so um, and, and Augustine passed away in the 430s. So they were essentially contemporaries and they had read their works. And so uh, Vincent lived in uh, southern France, and uh, Augustine Augustine of Hippo was in North Africa. So the letters didn't make it across the Mediterranean Sea there, back and forth. Um, okay, I know we, you know, I haven't gone super in-depth all that much uh, with this uh, talk, but that wasn't the point. I know some of these other sessions are going super deep, but I'm hoping just to keep it broad for you. Maybe get you a little bit interested to learn more about Christian Orthodoxy. And who knows, maybe here uh, for Veracity Hill we'll have some episodes just devoted to some of these heresies. And um, But I will do a little bit more research, Mr. Carr, there on, on your question about modalism. If I could think of um, modalists today, where do they appear? I'll, I'll give that some thought. That's a very good question. Good. Okay, well, if you don't have any other questions, then that'll do it. And we will... Uh, and for... Those of you listening online, we will be back with you next week. You've been listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. This is a listener-supported program. For more resources, including past shows, visit veracityhill.com.